Luke 16, starting at verse 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Okay, so... For believers, why should we talk about hell? Why should we think about it or dwell on it or even have any sermon on it at all? Why, why would we do this? Why should we talk about hell? It's definitely not fun. It's not enjoyable. There's lots of people, churches, ministers, who would like to minimize it, push it aside, or even say that it's not there, deny it altogether, because it's unpleasant to think about. It doesn't really fit our agendas for an inclusive, pluralistic society where everybody's right. So it's kind of unpopular. But I want to throw out there at least three reasons why we should talk about hell, or at least have one sermon on it. And the first is that the Bible talks about it. Everything that the Bible talks about belongs at the pulpit. And so if hell is one of those topics, then... We need to be preaching on it sometimes also. And not only does the Bible talk about it, but the one who mentions hell most of all is actually Jesus. Jesus is the one who is throwing out hell as a consequence most of all. So the Bible talks about it. Also, it shows us the gravity of sin and its consequences it's easy to think of our sins as just simple mistakes, misunderstandings, something that we can dismiss or just push aside or forget about, you know? But really, sin is not just simple mistakes. There's a lot of weight that goes with these things that we do wrong. And so, it's important for us to reflect once in a while that there but for the grace of God go I. If Christ did not come and he did not shed his blood, then absolutely every one of us would be ending up in hell, what we're talking about today. And number three, it shows us the greatness of God's grace. This is what was forgiven us. This is what Christ went through on our behalf. He suffered what we suffered and what we would have suffered so that we would escape. So as unpleasant as it is to talk about it, because Christ went through it, it's important for us to reflect on that. To be reminded of what kind of grace God has for us. Okay. So, let's dig in. According to the Bible, hell is a real place with real people there. 
There's some, again, who may not like that, but that is what the Bible says. And that verse up there is at the end of one parable where it says, these will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So there is an eternity for the righteous, and there is eternity for the unbelieving and the unrighteous. And there is, we talked a couple weeks ago about, there is an intermediate state where when believers die, their souls go to be with Christ in heaven. And we're there until Christ comes back again. There is also a temporary place of torment until the final judgment. And that's what we are seeing here in this, what Jesus says. So in Jude 1, it says this, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of that great day. So there are angels even who are in hell right now, in a temporary state until the final judgment that's coming. You notice in the passage that we read just after death, a rich man is tormented in Hades, it says. Hades is the realm of the dead, and it was something that even pagans believed in. And it was a very unpleasant place. And there's a lot of times that the Bible refers to it. I will not read you all of these times. But Hades, or a temporary state of the dead until the final judgment, is something that the Bible teaches. But there's also a permanent place of torment after the final judgment. So there's a temporary place, and then there's a final place. So just like believers with glory in heaven, so also for unbelievers in hell also. And this permanent place is sometimes called the lake of fire, which is mentioned that way in Revelation. That's your Bible reading track today. Um, There's also a word that Jesus uses for it called Gehenna. And that is a place near Jerusalem where they burn their garbage. And it was this place that was just smelly and awful. And it had its awful reputation because even child sacrifice had happened there in the Old Testament. And so it was a place that everything unclean went to be burned. And it just would be burning there 24 hours a day, this big inferno where all the garbage would go. And so once in a while in our Bibles, it would translate it hell. But sometimes Jesus is saying Gehenna, this garbage dump where everything is burned. So Hades is where the dead are. Gehenna is the final judgment. Look at the screen here with me, if you would. Let's answer this together. How does Christ return to judge the living and the dead comfort you. In all my distress and persecution, I turn my eyes to the heavens and confidently await as judge the very one who has already stood trial in my place before God and so has removed the whole curse from me. All his enemies and mine He will condemn to everlasting punishment, but me and all his chosen ones, he will take along with him into the joy and the glory of heaven. So at the final day, this is what's going to happen. The righteous will be separated from the unrighteous, the believing from the unbelieving. So what do we know about hell? There's a few things that the Bible says to us. And it's safe to say right at the start here that it's horrific beyond imagination. And it is horrific physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. It's difficult to describe how awful it will be. You notice that in what we just read here, that the rich man is aware of himself. He knows who he is. He remembers his life. And he even recognizes this this guy who used to beg at his door, named Lazarus. He remembers his brothers from his previous life, and yet he is in great torment. So he's the same person 
but he's in some terrible suffering. And it is eternal conscious suffering that hell is. There's some, some churches out there that would teach that, no, you just cease to exist. But there are verses that say that it is not that way. So one of them is Revelation 14, 11. It says, And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. So there's conscious, ongoing suffering there. And there's about Satan here. Revelation 20, verse 10, The devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So they are going to be tormented forever and ever. They are not going to cease to exist. There is an ongoing eternal punishment for them. You notice that in verse 23, the, the guy who's in hell, he says, I'm in torment. It's also the same word for torture. I'm being tortured here. It reminds me of, uh, of the parable that Jesus told about the the unforgiving servant, where his master summoned him in. You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. It should not, you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you. And in, hang, in anger, his master delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all his debt. I don't know about you, but Think about the the worst pain that you've ever experienced. The worst pain that you've ever experienced. I don't know about you, but for me, there was a time when I was allergic to to dairy, and I kind of grew out of it eventually, but there would be many nights where I would just be riling in pain on the bathroom floor just all night long, and I could not get comfortable. There was no rest for me there. At least that's what I, what I think of. This is, hell is torment. It's torture. It's described as fire. The man here says, I am in anguish in this flame, he says. So fire is a common, common idea for what hell is like. In Matthew 13, it says, the son of man will send his angels, and there were They will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. This big inferno of a furnace is another image of it. It's also described as darkness. And darkness in the Bible kind of has also connotations of of chaos and disorder. Everything is going wrong. So in 2 Peter 2.17... It's talking about people who are spreading false teachings arrogantly. And it says, These are waterless springs and mist driven by a storm. For them the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. Utter darkness. It's described as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a common recurring description that Jesus gives for it. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. In Matthew 22, it says, Then the king said to his attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That was a parable that Jesus told there. Gnashing of teeth, you don't use that word that often, but it basically means that you are gritting your teeth tightly together. Like that. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's also referred to as destruction. I didn't put that on the screen, but that is also one thing that is also associated with it. There's a couple times that Jesus says, it would be better for so-and-so, somebody who causes a little one to sin, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. And other times, Jesus says, it would be better to gouge out your own eye than to go to hell you'd be better off gouging out your own eye. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. 
It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So if you can imagine that, trying to gouge out your own eye, then you might have an idea about what he's talking about. But punishments will fit the crimes, too. And so there are going to be different levels of severity. So in Luke 12, it says that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. So there are going to be different consequences depending on circumstances. So he says it's better to gouge out your own eye Better to have a large millstone hung. But there's one person, at least, where Jesus said it would be better if he had never been born. And that would have been Judas Iscariot. So there are different levels in hell. Even to the point of Judas where he says it would be better if he had not been born. And it's described as both being apart from God as well as God's active punishment. Sometimes hell is talked about as a place where you are separated from God and God is far away. And other times it's described that God is punishing you himself. So, one example of being apart from God is Matthew 25. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me. You cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So, one example of being apart from God. Hell is separation. And there's another one where it talks about how God is doing the punishing himself. Matthew 10, 8, uh, 10 28. And this is Jesus talking. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And I have some other verses here, but I think you get the idea. There's in a sense that you are apart from God and separated from him. I mean, just like Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's when Jesus descended into hell, as we say. So, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? That's a, that's a fair question, isn't it? I mean, we just talked about how, how awful this place is. Why would a loving God send anyone there? Well, like I said a little earlier, sin is not just simple mistakes. This is not just something that we can brush aside. Sin is open offense toward the divine majesty it is disastrous in ways beyond our understanding, and it must be cleaned up to rid the world of suffering and shame. So you've been hearing a lot of Larry Nasser right now, and maybe even some of the horrible things that he has done. Can you imagine if we were to say to him, we as a society said to him, you know what, we can just let that go. We can forget about it, and you can just go free. Can you imagine that? Sin is like that. It is the cause, the root cause of all suffering and shame on this earth. And so it must be gotten rid of. And God wants to get rid of that, just like we like to get rid of our own human waste. I mean, we don't, it's, it's ugly, it's disgusting. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to think about it. That's what sin is. Sin must be gotten rid of. It belongs in the toilet and gone forever. It's not something small. The problem is, we hang on to our sins. That's the problem. So here's one verse from Ezekiel. As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, 
but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Pleading with them, I, I don't like this, but sin must be gotten rid of. You notice that this rich man that we just read about, you notice that he doesn't ask to be released. He asks to be served. Isn't that interesting? I mean, I'm thinking, if I was this guy, and I found myself in hell, and I saw the person I had wronged all these years on the other side over there, I would think, I would think, boy, I, boy, I really messed up. This is, this is bad. Can, please save me from this place. Get me out of here. But this rich man doesn't say that. He asks to be served. He has no repentance. He has no remorse. And this is something that I've noticed just in personal experience as well as in Scripture. When believers are afflicted, they grow. They humble themselves. Unbelievers are defiant until the end. Suffering is what really tests us. And the suffering that this guy's going through is showing what he's really like. He's not remorseful. He wants to be served by this guy that he wronged. Yeah, send him, send him down here to cool my tongue. That's what he asks for. Everyone in hell is there by their own choice. It's their choice. I like the way C.S. Lewis puts it in uh, The Great Divorce, which is a fascinating book if you care to read it sometime. He says this, There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. So just like this man, when he is in suffering and in hell, he doesn't ask to be released. He doesn't ask to be forgiven. He's not sorry at all. It shows the condition of his heart. He's defiant until the end. One other thing to throw out there is that God's omniscient justice is perfect. Nobody will say it's not fair. On that last day, when all has been accounted for, and God opens up all of the things of our hearts and our motives, all of our actions, and we receive our inheritance, Nobody is going to say it's not fair. Because God's justice is perfect. It's not okay. It's not good. It's perfect. So 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5. Therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. So God's going to even open up our, our hearts. What is our motives? And I also like the way the Belgian Confession puts it too. I think I have that up there. Oh, there it is. It says, The evil ones will be convicted by the witness of their own consciences and shall be made immortal, but only to be tormented in the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And one more, Colossians 3, 25. The wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. God's justice is perfect. He knows all things. And so nobody is going to get a raw deal at the end. We are all going to inherit fairness. Or maybe, maybe that's... Maybe that's not a good way to say it because for those who are righteous, we are going to get what's not fair. 
we are going to get eternal life with the Lord. And that's not fair. But that's what we will receive because what Christ has done for us. But at the last day, nobody is going to complain that it's not fair. Because God's justice is perfect. So I wanted to end by saying one more thing. This unpleasant, horrible place. The way to avoid this place is not by trying harder to be a good person. That's not how you avoid this place. The way to avoid hell is not by being a good person, but by repentance and belief in Jesus Christ. We need to repent and believe in Him. Our trust needs to be in Him. Famous verse is John 3.16. This comes right after John 3.16. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. By believing, we walk with Him, and by walking, we drop that sin we would otherwise cling to. If you have not put your trust in Jesus or not decided to follow Him and believe in Him, please come talk to me. I would love to be able to explain this to you more. Believers don't need to fear hell, but as the Bible talks about it, we need to know that it is there. And let's bow our heads and pray. Lord our God, what an awful place eternal punishment of hell will be. So Lord, we are, we are grateful for your grace and your mercy that you extend to us in Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus, we are so thankful that you went through all of that punishment so that we would be saved. That's beyond what we can comprehend, but Lord, thank you for that. And help us to be grateful and to take our sins seriously because of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.